and welcome to my channel, Reading Little Blue Books Out Loud. This is a little blue book. It just happens to be little blue book number 1515, and it is entitled The Love Affair of a Priest and a Nun. And it is written by Joseph McCabe. Let's see if we have a copyright on this one. doesn't look like it. Nope, no copyright date. Well, let's just get into it. The Love Affair of a Priest and a Nun Abel Lard and Heloise A pretentious little book was published a few years ago with the title The True Story of Abel Lard and Heloise. It is, in fact, little more than an encyclopedia article on the famous pair and does not differ from any recent book on the subject. There is, in modern times, no false story to be refuted. The last libel of Abelard was published in 1863 in Cotter Morrison's Life of St. Bernard. Morrison was a positivist and had an entirely perverse admiration of St. Bernard and the medieval church. On the strength of documents to which no historian of our time pays any attention, he represents Abelard as soon as he won fame as a teacher at Paris, indulging a fierce, fiery thirst for pleasure, sensual and animal. We are told that he drank deeply, wildly, but he then grew fastidious in particular. He required some delicacy of romance, some flavor of emotion, to remove the crudity of his lust. He seduced Heloise. This is sheer melodramatic monkish gossip, reproduced in the Puritan, Puritan accents of the rationalists of the Victorian age in England. Until Abelard met Heloise, he had been strict in his life, he gives us that assurance at a time when he was as deeply religious and remorseful as any man in France. Let me see if I turn the right page. Yep. And no serious historian hesitates to accept it. But the recent little work to which I have referred, and in fact most of the popular allusions of Abelard and Heloise, are in a different way just as misleading. It speaks to the love letters of Abelard and Heloise as the supreme representatives of amorous literature, the peerless gem of the collection, and so on. Hundreds of editions of the letters have appeared in various languages, and they never fail to be described as love letters. As they are published, they generally are love letters. The translator has seen to that. Even the most romantic of translators has some difficulty in getting the faintest allusion to love into the letters of Abelard, which were written in iced ink from beginning to end, but they are so manipulated that they are brought broadly under the title. Israel Galons included them in the Temple Classics, a pocket edition very neatly presented, but the version of Abelard's letters is as if someone had rewritten the laminations of Jeremiah in the language of a Persian poet. Nearly all the versions are in one degree or other most misleading. Scott Montcrief, a few years ago, brought out a new version which I have not seen. At the British National Library, they wanted me to go to read, go to read it in the special room in which they put us to read Havelock, Ellis, or Arabian Nights, and I snortingly declined. So I say nothing about it, but I know no version of the letters which does not misrepresent them. In the first place, they are not love letters, and ought never to have been included in that type of literature. 
An amorous correspondence implies two lovers, whereas at the time when Abelard wrote these letters he had, by physical mutilation and years of deep suffering, lost even the feeblest capacity for emotion, and looked back on his love of many years earlier with the utmost horror. His language would have chilled if it did not convert a maid of Andalusia. I don't know where that's at. It is inhuman in its bleak attitude toward love and life. For a short time, Heloise seems to have tried to rekindle in his heart some sort of chaste affection for her. But after her second letter, she realized that his heart was quite dead, and she abandoned the attempt. Of a hundred pages of correspondence between the two, only four or five in the letters of Heloise are consider concerned with love and the translation of these generally falsifies their significance. They are really amazing declarations. For the Middle Ages, and on the part of the abbess of a strict nunnery, yet they are not love letters in the ordinary sense. I should like to point out the surprising features of them, the remarkable light they throw on that rather obscure age, and I will translate directly and literally from the Latin the principal passages to which I refer. Everybody knows something about the famous love affair which so captivated the heart of France in the later age that they put the remains of the abbot and abbess in a common tomb in the chief cemetery of Paris, where young men and women still lay flowers in memory of their love. Who Heloise really was, we do not know. We first meet her about the year 1117, when she was about eighteen years old, living in Paris with an uncle who was a canon of the Paris Cathedral. He was passionately fond and proud of her, and it was not usual for clerical dignitaries to have pretty nieces living with them. It is said that she had been educated at the nearby convent of Argental, which was very fashionable and very lax. There are irresistible ingredients for a romance and it was at all events said in a later age, and may be perfectly true, that she was the daughter of Canon Fulbert and the Lady Abbess of Argenteau. When her bones were transferred to Paris in the 18th century, they were examined by a medical man, and he pronounced that she must have had a handsome and finely proportioned figure. Abelard merely says that she was not the least and beauty of face. But that was in the days when he thought pretty faces were snares of the devil. Let us imagine the young lady is a lovely maid of seventeen or eighteen, living with her fond uncle in one of the old houses on the edge of the island in the middle of the, of the scene. It was the time when school life had been re-established in France, and there was, in fact, quite a fever of intellectual work. There were a dozen schools at Paris generally attached to the abbeys, and probably several thousand pupils had been attracted from all parts of France and Europe. In provincial schools one learned the elements of knowledge, grammar, or Latin literature, rhetoric, or the art of disputing, music, and so on. At Paris, and in the other cities, some stuffy and safe old divine lectured every day on such points of theology as lay open to discussion and interpretation, such as, this is literally one of the points, whether Mary felt pain or pleasure at her conception. But an element of gaiety had been introduced. Not only did the students of the various provinces and nations brawl and sing on the playing fields and in the numerous taverns of the green district which is now the squalid latin quarter of paris but a man could stand up to the master of the school and dispute his opinion it was not so much an age of positive knowledge as of keen rhetoric and bands of disorderly students roved from school to school and even town to town whether whenever a brilliant new master or opponent of a master was heard of Heloise took a keen interest in the school life. It was in first place the most conspicuous and unavoidable feature of the life of Paris at the beginning of the 20th century. 
It had grown out of the proportion of the civil and commercial life of the city. But the worst age of the subjection of women had not yet been reached in Europe, and there were schools for women, not merely convent schools such as that in which Heloise had received her early education, but schools of philosophy and literature in which lay, in which lay women taught. Canon Fulbert also was something of a scholar, and he saw that his niece wrote good Latin and read the Latin classics. She already had quite a name for literary accomplishments in Paris. The latest, latest sensation of the school world was that a brilliant Breton, Breton scholar named Peter Abelard, who had been tilting at the older masters for years, had beaten his last and most learned opponent and won his place in the chief school, and he was attracting unprecedented crowds of students by his dazzling and daring le lectures. No scholar could stand against him. At the age of thirty-seven he had driven out the most famous teachers of Christendom, and he turned in, into ridicule any man who came to his school to oppose him. No woman could attend the school at Notre Dame, but it was close to the canon's home on the island, and all Paris pointed out the figure of the gifted master who he came to when he came to and left the school. He was very handsome too, and according to Heloise, as he passed indifferently amongst them, he was one of those cold intellectual machines whose vitality is entirely abandoned, absorbed, sorry, entirely absorbed in study and ambition. The next sensation of Paris was when the brilliant teacher became a lodger of Canon Fulbert and tutor of his accomplished niece, a dangerous approximation in an age which was just as truly the dawn of sentiment of chivalry as of intellect. Abelard confesses that he had already fallen in love with Heloise and had taken up residence in the canon's house to be near her. The cleric was tempted by the offer of a large payment and private lessons to his niece, and he was disarmed by Abelard's reputation for indifference to women. But soon, says Abelard, there were more kisses than lessons and my hands went more easily to her breast than to the books. Soon, says Heloise, in truth, soon, says Heloise, in turn, in truth, my name was sung in every street, may every house of Paris. She means that, to the astonishment first and then the delight of the city, the great and merciless Dialecti dialectician was composing lyrics of the most glowing description, and all Paris, which sang them in the open-air taverns, knew the inspiration. Abelard tells the sequel in his first letter, The Story of My Calamities. A dozen years later he found himself the abbot of a quaint body of monks on the coast of Brittany. Each monk had a wife and children, and all that they wanted of the new Lord Abbot was that he should use his famous gift to get more meat and wine, which were scanty, for them and their families. When he began to lecture them on their wild and improper ways, they put poison in the blood of Christ, which he drank from the chalice in the Mass. They hired a few cutthroats, and whenever the Abbot went about the country, these men tried to ambush him. It was a horrid situation for one of the most brilliant scholars of Christendom. He had fled to the limit of France, to the wild shore of the Atlantic, because Paris and every other town seemed to be full of enemies and mockers. A synod of stupid clerics, led by bitter opponents and rivals, had condemned him as a heretic. He was being denounced all over France in the terms which Cotter Morrison foolishly reproduces, yet his life was in danger in Brittany because he was an apostle of virtue. It was in these circumstances that he wrote the first of the series of letters, and it was certainly not a love letter. It was an account of his sufferings written to some anonymous friend, the name Philantus, which appears in some versions of that of his friend, is a fictitious is as fictitious as a good deal of his of the letter. 
The only part of this that is interesting and significant, apart from its autobiographical material, is a very long passage in which he gives the arguments to, of Heloise against marriage. Fulbert had at least been convinced of the amorous relation and had dismissed Abelard from the house. They met secretly, and one day Heloise wrote him, not with the usual tears and trepidations, but with the greatest joy that she was to become a mother. He took her, disguised as a nun, to his sister's house near Nantes, where little Astrolab was born. The romanticist, who enthuses over the immortal love, fights shy of the name of the child. It is the name of an astronomical instrument which the Moors had introduced into Europe. It was a highly intellectual business from beginning to end, even Heloise protesting all through that it was not lust she sought. Abelard was very concerned to keep his love and his career, and he went back to Paris to conciliate the canon by offering a secret marriage. It is not clear that he was then a priest, and not certain that at least that time he could not marry even if a priest, but marriage would certainly cut him off from higher advancements. Celibacy was being enforced from the top downward. They came back and were secretly married in the presence of the canon, but the remarkable thing is that Heloise was strongly opposed to the idea of marriage. She held that marriage would ruin his public life and be a calamity to him and the world. She urged him to see what curses would fall on her, what tears of philosophers would be shed, what a loss it would be to the church. She pointed out how indecent, how lamentable it would be if a man whose nature had created for all should be linked to one woman. She reminds him of St. Paul's opinion of marriage, and then, if he will not listen to Paul, let him ponder what Theophratus and Cicero and Seneca say about it. A great scholar like Abelard, she says, must be kept away from the crying of babies and the fuss of nurses and the unpleasant sights connected with babies. They would not be able to live in a big house where these things could be kept from him. She returns to the pagan philosophers, quotes Josephus on the ways of the essences, and Nazarenes brings Jerome and Augustine to bear on the situation. Think of the fate of poor Socrates, she says, and she reminds him how when his wife Xanope, after a violent triad, triad, emptied a certain vessel of a certain liquid over him, the poor philosopher could only say, after so much thunder one expects rain. In fine, she asks him to see how much sweeter it would be for her and better for me. No. It would be how sweeter it would be for her and better for me to call friend than wife, so that affection, not the coercion of the bond of matrimony, should keep me to her. And she predicted that her uncle would never be reconciled, so it was useless. We shall see in, in a moment how Heloise amplifies this remarkable modernist note of her argument against marriage, but she was at least right about Fulbert. He began to boast that his niece was married to the great teacher, and when people came to Heloise to ask, she swore an oath that it was false. From the rose which followed, Abelard rescued his wife by placing her in the convent at Argentile, where she dressed as a nun, though she did not take the vows and as it was a more than liberal convent, he had free access to her there. So Fulbert took his horrid revenge. He bribed Abelard's valet, and while he lay in bed, he was castrated. There was a terrific uproar in Paris, not so much at the nature of the mutilation, which was not uncommon in those pious days. Wow. But because Abelard was the idol of the city, Heloise would have us believe that the ladies shed streams of tears, the valet and the hired man were caught and lost their eyes and genitals, and Abelard 
when he recovered a little, as he miraculously did, you will agree that it was a miracle if you know anything about surgery in the 20th century. When men had no idea of the cir circulation of the blood, even demanded that Fulbert should be fined in the same way. Here began the calamities of Peter Abelard. For the most brilliant teacher in Europe, he became an object of pity and shame. Cut off by his condition from all higher e e ecclesiastical preferment, he decided to become a monk at the Royal Abbey of St. Denis, and the monks, not being psychologists, welcomed the accession of the gifted teacher and songwriter, and especially the songwriter. It was said Abelard of Abbey, of worldly and most disgraceful life, Abbot Adam was the gayest of them all, and when Abelard, the new, and when Abelard, the new Abelard, began to chide them for the abominable filth of their lives, they reflected that they had taken a serpent to their bosom. When the poor man went on to discover that St. Dennis was not the man they thought, and was imprudent enough to say so, they boiled over with wrath. So he was hauled before a synod and condemned, and he looked with scorn on the crowd of stupid churchmen who filled the cathedral, and the papal legate who knew and cared no more about theology than the local barber. And I think we'll stop there. And I'll see you again in part two.